Um, my name is Myra Lee Wilson. I'm with the Hills Garden Club of Wellesley. Um, thank you to everyone who showed up this morning. Thanks to everybody who brought that fabulous spread over there on the table. Please make sure you get more <laughs> and more and make sure it's all gone. Um, and thanks to Heidi for bringing the beautiful flowers. What a nice, what a nice touch for spring. <laughs> Or an appetizer, maybe that's what it is. So, um, so we have three garden groups here this morning. We have the Wellesley Garden Club, the Wellesley Garden Study Group, and then the Hills Garden Club of Wellesley. Um, it's a joint venture we don't always do, except for the joint council meeting, which will be next month. And a little sidebar. This will be coming in your own little email distribution list. This is... Um, a conversation with Roger Swain next month. Um, he's, uh, what was the name of his program? Victory Garden. The Victory Garden on PBS. Yes. Um, anyway, he's will be a huge treat. So, um, I think we'll have a couple of people from other clubs step up and if there's any business to conduct or say hello. But, um, but before we do that, I just wanted to say that, um, and you may have have noticed from my accent that I didn't grow up here. I <laughs> um, grew up in Fort Worth, Texas, and um, I have to say, we've moved around a bunch, but I've been here in Wellesley for ten and a half years, and I've come to the conclusion that New Englanders are tough. I mean, you have to be. I mean, oh my gosh, I'm just so impressed. Um, <laughs> And, and this is also probably the sunniest winter in the ten and a half years that I've lived here. Even though we may not have feet of snow, but we'll still have many, many gray days. But this is, I think, the sunniest. But um, while our people may be tough, my plants are not so tough. <laughs> and so now I think our, our speaker is going to really address that and teach us what can really survive in our New England garden. So, but we'll um, get to her shortly. That was just a little tidbit. Um, and now we'll turn it over to whoever would like to say something from another club. And thank you so much for being here. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lorraine O'Hanlon, and I am the president of the Wellesley Garden Study Group for this year. And a couple of just real quick announcements. Uh, not a whole lot of business to conduct, but just highlighting some dates. Um, as Myra Lee said, the um, joint council meeting is on May 4th, and so um, for our club members, our treasurer, Alan Stalin, is here, and if you'd like to purchase your ticket today, it's $15, and tickets are limited uh, because it's obviously all the clubs together, so um, if you can buy your ticket today, that would be tremendous. Um, we have... Um, our Garden Therapy Friendship Circle Luncheon is on Monday, April 8th, and uh, Lori Plum is organizing that for our committee, so if you're on her committee, you'll be getting email updates uh, with your assignments and all that. Uh, don't forget about Art and Bloom, which is April 26th to 29th at the MFA. Our club is not doing a field trip, but we encourage you all to attend. And Frances Antonelli and her assistant, Erin Riley, will be um, creating a piece on behalf of our club, and so we're very excited to see that. So I encourage uh, everyone to go to that. Um, we are doing our um, Kentucky Derby fundraiser party on May 4th at my house. Um, it's going to be from 5 to 7.30, and um, so you'll be getting further updates and emails on that. Um, but we are having a planning meeting on March 25th at my house, and our newsletter will be going out in the next week or so, so there'll be a reminder about that. But I encourage anybody interesting, interested in helping with that event to come to the planning meeting on March 25th. Um, for our board members, that's also going to be an extra board meeting that's not in the program, in the yearbook. Um, we've added that just to try to um, be able to conduct a little more business um, since we don't have a meeting in April. Um, and then finally, uh, well, two, two, second to last, um, we were going to have our annual, um, May annual meeting on May 13th. Um, it's going to be uh, 
uh, tour and picnic lunch at the gardens at Clock Barn in Carlisle. Um, and so again, you'll be getting more details in the um, newsletter and look for an email from uh, Blast. We're going to do box lunches from Roach Brothers and so you will be asked to make a selection of what type of lunch you want and RSVP to me because I am the um, refreshment chair for that meeting. Um, and that's it, I think, other than um, Michelle Livingston is our nominating chair, and she was just going to make a very quick announcement. I have the best Thank you, Heidi. Good morning, ladies. My name is Deb Roby, and I'm uh, one of the program chairs for the Hills Garden Club. And I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker this morning. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about Karen Bussolini, who is a nationally known garden photographer. She's a writer, a speaker, an eco-friendly garden coach. We could all use a coach in life and in gardening, right? Karen writes an email newsletter that you may wish to subscribe to after listening to her this morning, so um, you can. It is all available on her website, which is karenbussolini.com. And let me point out that she has brought a number of books that she has been involved in, in the publication of. I would imagine they're, most of them are your photography, your garden photography. So feel free to peruse those after her talk. And she has brought handouts. So if you like some of the things that she's going to talk about today and you don't want to take notes while she's speaking, right at the end of the table, you'll see some handouts. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome Karen Bussolini to speak with us this morning. Thanks. It's, it's great to be here. And um, if I start fading out, would somebody just say, speak up? So if you would like to sign up for eco-friendly news, views, clues, and how-tos, I will send a clipboard around because you need to opt in these days. I can't just send it to you. So if somebody will, the, if the last person would just bring it up to the book table, that'd be great. Terrific. Well, um, I've heard it said many times that you don't really know how to grow a plant until you've killed it at least three times. Um, so I must confess I've probably killed more than my share because of having been involved with um, what used to be called the Garden Writers Association of America. Now it's Garden Com. And all of these you know, plant companies give you plants to try. Um, I travel a lot. I have... I, I garden on a deer-infested mountainside. I work long hours, and I really do not fancy lugging hoses up my mountainside to water anything. Um, so it really is survival of the fittest in my garden. Um, but also, as we move toward more sustainable and restorative way of gardening and learning from nature how things work in nature as opposed to how they work in horticulture and what all the books tell you to do, um, I think it's important to keep in mind that when we're conserving resources, our own time and um, money and effort are also resources worth conserving. So I hope I can save you some time and trouble and heartbreak. You've probably noticed that those $8 perennials now cost, uh, you know, $22, $23, $24. Um, but we all kill plants, so you shouldn't feel like you're a failure. That is how you learn. Um, I would like to uh, shorten the odds a little bit on survival. 
So, you know, some plants, as we've all learned, just look good in the catalogs. Some are prima donnas and just don't make it. Some are a little bit too enthusiastic. Um, we're going to look at two really important kinds of plants, ones that are widely adaptable and ones that are adapted to the conditions you have in your gardens. So I've really, uh, due to my neglect and travels and disinclination to fuss over things, um, I've really come to value those plants that do three things. I expect plants to be beautiful, to solve problems, and to support wildlife. So that's going to be my, my focus. So I hope that um, looking at some survival strategies, we can learn how to select plants that will survive in our gardens. And the whole Darwinian thing is, you know, Darwin said, plants and animals are bound together by a complex web of relations, which I think is important to pay attention to. But first, let's look at some plants. So some survival strategies. Um, oh yeah, could we, could we get the lights turned down a little bit so you can see the pictures better? So this is um, Artemisia stellariana, is that better there? on the Cape Cod dunes. So these are taking the brunt of, you know, full force of the wind and the salt, salt air, sometimes salt water inundation, um, sunshine, you name it, it's really exposed. And in what some might call excessively well-drained soils, um, and there it is surviving. And silver is a mechanism for survival. So they're perfectly well adapted. But, you know, gardening is so much, so often a story of love and loss. We all fall in love with plants that we can't grow. My friend in Austin uh, loves lilacs, and she spent the whole winter, she had an, an outdoor kitchen with an ice making machine, and she put ice cubes around her lilacs, trying to get them to have enough chilling hours to bloom, and they never did. Um, this is Virginia Beach at Christmas time, and I pulled into town. I thought, "What is this? A Christo installation? What the heck is that?" And then I saw the palm fronds. So it's like in the summer, they're palm-lined avenues, and this is what they have to do to keep them alive over the winter. Um, it's like you know, life is too short for those kinds of measures. <laughs> Um, and this this garden really got me thinking. This, so this is what a neighbor called her Darwinian cutting garden, where she just threw anything she had or took a fancy to and let them slug it out. And there were two really um, kind of illustrative examples. So she had um, uh, so Artemisia Silver King and Elizamachia, and they are both garden thugs. They will take over if you plant them in your perennial garden. Well, she had them in a bed between a stone wall and a walk, so they couldn't travel out of it. But she noticed that, you know, in dry years, the Artemisia silver king really took over and kind of outcompeted the Lysimachia. And in wet years, the Lysimachia took over because it preferred the more wet situations. So, um, you know, this little garden really got me thinking about that. And, you know, we think about plants like slugging it out, different kinds of plants slugging it out with each other, but the whole idea of survival of the fittest is within a species or within a genus. So uh, this is Leucophyta brownii, the Australian cushion bush, and maybe once upon a time this was green, but in nature, as opposed to horticulture, where so many of the plants we buy are vegetal propagated clones, so they're, they're genetically identical. Um, in nature, there's a lot of variability. And so maybe as the climate changed, the ones that were a little more silver, which is protective against heat and drought and sun, um, those were the ones that survived to be able to reproduce. And then their progeny that exhibited those characteristics went on and on and on and on. and you know, silver plants are actually green underneath it all, but it has silver hairs that make it look look green. 
and the leaves are so reduced that to, to hold on to water. Um, so those are the ones that are going to survive. This is a, um, a, lupine, a, a lupin in Idaho, and this has a kind of double whammy for survival. So underneath that silvery look, it's really green leaves, but the silver hairs trap moisture next to the surface of the leaf. They prevent the wind from desiccating that leaf, and they are reflective, so each little hair is reflecting sunlight, and each little hair is making a shadow. And then look at the, the leaf, the shape of the leaf. It's cupped, so it further is protected from um, desiccation from the sun and the wind. And then when you look at something like our native moose wood, this is Acer pensylvanicum, which is an understory plant in the northeast forest. And look at how large and tender those leaves are. So those are not protecting themselves from the sun. Those want to be soft and tender so that they can soak up as much sun as possible. So there's, you know, there's a clue to survival that generally downy silver plants aren't what you'd plant in the woodland. Um, you want to look for things with large, soft, tender leaves. Um, this colocasia, this elephant ears, is really big and really dark. It's from a tropical place where it's hot, and it's not worried about um, protecting itself from the sun, and it's not worried about water loss because they're grow it's growing in a wet environment. So, you know, really big dark leaf and a really little silver leaf are worlds apart. So when you buy plants, that should be a clue. Um, closer to home, a hosta planted on a, um, a, a southwest facing street corner next to a hydrant where the dogs pee is not a great place for a woodland plant. And um, these leaves are all kind of burned on top, but with a big clumping thing like that, those upper leaves protect the lower ones. So not a great sighting for such a plant. As a rule of thumb, when it comes to silver plants, the downier and hairier the plant is, the better drainage, the more sun, and the more um, air circulation it requires. Though I must say, you know, those Artemisia stellariana on the, on the dunes in Cape Cod, I've totally failed to grow. As far as that plant's concerned, I'm cursed with rich woodland soil, and they just rot and die and get funky. Um, despite having um, written the, I'm co-author of a book called Elegant Silvers about silver plants, um, I have utterly failed to grow this, this plant. So for a while I was resorting to, well, you know, I'm writing a book on this. I need to really try all these. I would wheelbarrow up the back slope, grit and sand, trying to build some lousy soil so that I could grow these things that want such good drainage. Um, that might be okay for one little place and for trying things, but it's really not recommended as a way to treat your whole yard. Um, so I extend silver plants to things like blue spruce that have this, this um, waxy bloom on it, and that also protects from desiccation from sun and wind. Another way plants hold onto water is to be succulent so that leaves or stems hold on to water and store it and can use it later. So this, I love this. This is at the San Diego Botanic Garden and it's an undersea reef made all of succulent plants. And they even, they painted the building blue. You see the, the, uh, the jellyfish in the back. <laughs> and so the way leaves, the, the way plants arrange leaves on themselves, this was an acotillo from Madagascar that I was really intrigued by. I found it growing in Arizona at a botanical garden. So it has reduced leaves. So something with tiny leaves is really trying to photosynthesize but trying to protect itself from too much sun. And look at the way they're lined up. So each individual leaf can collect the sun, but it's not shading the ones below. And maidenhair ferns do that too. So maidenhair ferns are 
a moisture-loving woodland plant. And I love that kind of swirly gesture, but those whorls, the way the leaves are arranged on the plant, and the way they're dissected means that the light hits the ones on the top and it goes through individual leaflets so that um, light hits all of the leaves on the plant all the way from top to bottom. So given that, what I've said so far, would anybody venture a guess as to which of these iris is more drought resistant? Right? Right, so the one on the left, Iris pallida, um, Oreo variegata, or it's sold as zebra. I love this plant. I, I grow it for the foliage alone because it's so beautiful. So that, that waxy coating, that slight blue-green color, makes it much more drought-resistant than the um, Siberian Iris on the right, which really appreciate a lot more moisture. So with darker, darker leaves without that waxy coating. And then, you know, I don't know what the fruit on this tree is, but I bet it's really good. <laughs> so um, this soap floss tree, it's a tropical tree, um, has all of these thorns. And thorns are dead. Thorns are like hair. They don't need to put energy. The plant doesn't need to put energy into making living tissue here. These are, these are hard, dead things that are going to any, deter anything that wants to climb up and eat that fruit. Then we have chemical warfare. So this is black walnut. And um, it has a chemical in it called juglone. And what happens is that it exudes out through the roots, it's in the leaves, and it goes out through pores into the air and mixes with oxygen. And it um, poisons anything that wants to grow near it. Um, it's highly toxic to many insects. It's actually, it can be used as a pesticide, actually, um, or an herbicide. People who use wood chips from wood shops for their horse bedding or animal bedding always want to make sure there's no black walnut in because it adversely affects the, it'll cause deformities in the hooves of horses. Um, but it's worth paying attention to. There you know, it's a native tree. It has co-associations with other plants in nature. It's not all by itself. Um, so uh, lilacs, which are not native here, but red buds, heucheras, and monarda are quite tolerant. They can grow near this tree, but azaleas and rhododendrons and blueberries are highly sensitive, and they will really suffer and or die if you plant them near a black walnut tree. So a lot of plants have that characteristic. It's called, um, they're allelopathic. Um, oaks, sugar maples, junipers to some extent, sumac, even rhododendrons, elderberries, um, they have those chemical effects in, in, to some degree. Ever notice that the grass under your bird feeder is really crummy looking when you have sunflower shells with those sunflower seed husks are allelopathic. They exude a chemical that prevents other plants from germinating. So that's a really useful kind of skill to have if you're an annual like a sunflower and you want to germinate and not be crowded out by other things germinating. And you know we all know when, when it comes to that kind of chemical warfare about the whole monarch butterfly and, and milkweed family, uh, there are other insects that can eat milkweed family plants. There's an, a milkweed tussock moth, and there are those orange aphids you get on them. But this, that's, other insects can eat milkweeds, but milkweeds are the only plant that these can eat because it's expensive to make that adaptation. There are cardiac glyphosides in milkweed sap that will kill insects. And, and a lot of animals don't want to eat it either. So it has been expensive to make the adaptation that allows, say, monarchs to di ingest and digest um, these leaves. So we have all through the plant kingdom 
90% of our insects require specific plants. They're specialists on specific plants. And 96% of our songbirds, according to Doug Tallamy, who wrote Bringing Nature Home, require insects to feed their babies. So, you know, that's part of that whole complex web. And if we can plant native plants that support those insects, that support those birds, that spread the seeds, um, we won't be trying to uh, weed and water and fertilize the forest because you don't need to do that. So here's a non-native. This is a euphorbia, and it has that, that milky caustic sap in it. So I can vouch deer never eat this. If you work with any euphorbia, wear gloves because it's worse than poison ivy and it's activated by sun. And there are other plants that sun activates the chemicals, like St. John's wort. Like if you take St. John's wort pills for um, depression or you know, winter effect, affective disorder, um, you have to cover your arms, you'll get sunburned because sun activates it even when it's in your system. But I noticed that uh, St. John's wort gets these leaf rollers and what they do is, they roll themselves up in the leaves and they can chew away because the sun isn't hitting them, they're inside the leaves. So that's one of those Darwinian adaptations. Um, deer have certainly figured out which of these have toxic or disagreeable chemicals inside. I mean, good luck growing tulips where I live. Um, a lot of silver plants and, and those Mediterranean herbs have vol VOCs, so volatile organic compounds, and that's where the fragrance comes and the flavor, and they play a role in, in holding on to moisture but also deterring uh, herbivores, whether they be um, insects or four-legged, what do we call them, four-legged uh, large rats with antlers and other plants. <laughs> so fragrance is, is, a, is a good, you know, a really strong fragrance is a, is a good clue if you have um, large herbivores in your yard. Um, scent does deter things. This, every time I'm in my garden in the spring and I think, oh man, the skunks are out. You know, because I'm on a slope and the scent's kind of drifting down the slope. And then I realized, oh, the Fritillaria imperialis, they smell like skunks. So what deer is gonna stick their head right into something that smells like a skunk? Um, anthocyanin, so uh, uh, something with dark leaves like this might be um, a deterrent for something like tulips, which uh, deer certainly do love. And so other plants you see, like this is, um, this is Heuchera, I'm sorry, Penstem and Huskers Red. And this is the foliage in the winter. And you see this in a lot of alpine plants. So when you have a plant that has that red foliage, the anthocyanins play a role in kind of acting like um, antifreeze. So they, they are protective in the winter. And they also are less palatable to insects. So um, say you have a choice of, oh, what is that? There's a, um, there's a wild geranium that has red foliage. It's not gonna be as palatable to insects, which on the one hand is perhaps desirable, but on the other hand, those native insects that depend on eating it are gonna be deterred a little bit because that makes it less palatable. And so here, this is a Japanese mustard spinach grown through the snow in my garden. That red color really protects them in the winter. So we have um, all different strategies for life cycle survival. Um, you know, the invest, the playoff between investment in structure and reproduction. So annuals are one strategy that plants take. So they. They grow, they flower, they set seed, and the individual plant dies, but the species lives on. 
um, in the seeds that get distributed and come up the next year. Unless, of course, you're buying all proven winners sterile clones that don't, um, don't ever set seed. And then we have at the other end, you know, something like this is Nissa sylvatica, the tupelo tree that puts a lot of its energy into making this big structure. And that big structure is kind of rigid. Um, we have shrubs that are more flexible that are kind of, you know, in between herbaceous things and a big tree. They're not as likely to break. They're, um, they're more pliable with wind. And things like staghorn sumac, which is one of my favorite plants, that sucker, so they, they have rhizomes that go underground and come up, they're colonizing. You can, you can see how it starts in the middle and it just, the clump grows bigger and bigger and bigger. They spread underground. That's a really great colonizing strategy. And that's something that people say, oh, I don't want that plant in my garden, it suckers. And a lot of naturally suckering plants, once they become cultivars and are uh, vegetatively propagated, lose that ability to clone themselves. So you may not want sumac taking over your garden, but if you have a big area to fill and you want a great native plant, these suckering shrubs, you know, really, they solve a problem. They're beautiful, they solve a problem, and they support wildlife in the appropriate place. So then, you know, we have things like, this is Snow Princess. It's, it's a, a, a proven winner's annual. And the tip-off is, if something is advertised as having, it, if it has bigger flowers and it nonstop bloom, that means it's sterile. So my question that nobody has definitively answered because it's, it's really variable is, if a plant is sterile, why would it produce nutritious nectar or pollen to support bees or pollinators or other insects if it doesn't need to reproduce? It has no need to attract insects. So I think that, sure, maybe some pots. It's nice having something that blooms all summer, but uh, you, know, you can't fill your whole yard with this if you want to support wildlife in any way. Although this is one, a lot of what are marketed as annuals are really tender perennials. And this is silver ponyfoot, Dichondra argentea, um, silver falls. And I just adore this plant. And so I use it, but um, I don't, again, I don't fill my whole garden with it. It's such a great background. So another strategy for survival is to grow through the season and then go dormant and store the energy in a bulb underground. And these are the snowdrops that are blooming in my garden right now. I love it. I looked out in the snow and, you know, when the snow melted, there they are again. Um, so these are completing their life cycle before the deciduous trees overhead leaf out. Um, when, th when bulbs go dormant, they do it either during the cold season, which is what the ones hardy here do, or during the dry season. So say in, in California and in dry places, you have bulbs that will bloom you know, in the winter or the spring or, or the, the, whenever the dry season isn't, and then they store their energy to wait out the dry season. And then we have these kind of traveling reproductive things. This is a goldenrod I pulled out of my garden with rhizomes, which are underground stems. And you can see how this is what bittersweet's doing too. Every, every, uh, every node, a new plant is coming up. So that's a, that's a pretty good survival strategy. This is Phlox stolonifera, which is Another one of my very favorite plants, very useful, beautiful. The instant it blooms, the hummingbirds come, the very instant. And it's stoloniferous, so you can see those little stems reaching out. Those stems grow out, and when they hit the ground, they root, and they wind up making a mat of foliage. So a great native plant. Then we have biennials, and this is Salvia argentea. And biennials make a rosette the first year and quite often have a tap root, so they're quite often rather hard to transplant. So here's this big, beautiful 
woolly um, first year rosette, and I don't have a shot of the of the second year when they bloom and set seed and die. Um, but this is clary sage, which looks very much alike, but it, Salvia argenti has a white flower. So the second year, the leaves are green, they flower, they set seed, they die. So a lot of people get really frustrated with things like um, cardinal flower. That it's like, I plant it, and maybe it comes back the next year, maybe it doesn't. Well, in horticulture, they call it a short-lived perennial, but in ecological terms, it's a disturbance plant, right? So if you keep disturbing the ground around it, it will keep germinating. It needs to get brought up to the light. If you have it in a perfectly mulched bed, it's not going to do anything. If you have it in a place, you know, think of where it grows, on a stream bank where the water's constantly disturbing the soil. Um, if you rake around where it is, you know, once it goes, let it go to seed and whack the seeds around and rake, you'll, you'll have it come back. Ever notice that Echinacea doesn't live all that long in your garden, but it self sows all over the place? And they all look kind of wimpy? Well, that's because this is native to the edge of prairies and woodlands. And when there's a constantly moving edge, it's like the prairie's not moving into the woodlands, right? The woodlands moving into the prairies. They can't pick themselves up and move. So their strategy is to live a short life, reproduce like crazy, and so their seeds remain, the species remains, even though the individual plants don't. Another um, seeding strategy is, this is Chasmanthium latifolium, and has very heavy seeds that tend to just drop where they are. So if you don't make lovely bouquets of this plant, I find that it's, it must be too big for our overwintering songbirds to eat. Um, all of those seeds drop to the ground and every blessed one of them will germinate. <laughs> but it's so beautiful. Another seed dispersal strategy is this is our native witch hazel. And you see these capsules. Like when you walk in the woods in November, you can hear them. They just go, they're, they're like missiles. They'll shoot out 20 or 30 feet. And what that does is it prevents competition with the mother plant and it prevents monoculture. So they're, you know, they're cross-pollinated and they're shooting off somewhere. They're not just dropping right below the plant or things like maples. These maple seeds are called samaras, and you can see them whirling like helicopters through the, through the sky when they drop. So it's, it's keeping competition away from the parent and preventing monocultures. And then, of course, things like this is butterfly weed. They sail here and there and everywhere. And plants that depend on wind pollination or wind dispersal tend to have a lot of seeds because it's kind of chancy. And then there are other seeds that uh, require an animal to transport them or a person with, uh, with nice stretchy pants on that they can cling to. <laughs> and many plants, why do we have berries? Berries are a nutritious, delicious package around a seed that encourages an animal or a bird to disperse it far from the parent plant. And there's a really interesting phenomenon. If you look at native plants that have berries in the fall, like this is our native dogwood, they're red. Or this is um, Cornus alternifolia, the pagoda dogwood, and the lenticels are red. Or our native Virginia creeper, and the foliage is red. And that red color is advertisement. It's advertising to the native birds that they co-evolved with. Here is great nutrition for you just at the time that you are migrating. So it's providing all the fats and lipids that, that birds need to fuel their, um, their migration or to help them survive if they're if they're sticking around for the winter. And then you look at things like um, invasive Japanese honeysuckle, 
and it's just sweet. I mean, birds like sweet stuff too, but that would be like running a marathon fueled by jelly beans, <laughs> right? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the law of self-organization. If you think of how a body comes to being, um, an ecosystem works the same way, you know, starting with, you know, a simple cell, a couple cells, they split, and over time, all of the parts of the body, all the, they turn into different kinds of cells, so they're tightly integrated and they're very specialized that, you know, we have skin cells and eye cells and toenail cells and, and everything else. Well, an ecosystem works that way too. So if we can think of our gardens that way, having that kind of diversity and tightly integrated plantings, um, plants will find a niche where they do best and, and, and hang in there. So can we think in terms of systems in our yards rather than individual plants? A simple system like this, here's an extreme example. Um, it has a high rate of disturbance, right? The tide goes in and out twice a day. It has very few structures, so there's not much diversity in the habitat. Um, and there's a lot of mutually exclusive competition. And then to contrast with that, you look at our native deciduous forest. And this is a mature complex system. So it's got a lot of physical structure. It has a low rate of disturbance and it has a low rate of exclusionary competition. So everything in this forest has sorted itself out so that nothing's directly competing with anything else. So you have those canopy trees catching the light way up high. You have the understory trees like witch hazel. This is our fall blooming native witch hazel. Then you have understory shrubs. You have a ground layer. Everything has its place above and below ground and in season, early and late. So it's highly complex. And even underground, you know, we have all of these mycorrhizae, we have all kinds of detritivores and insects. The ground in a forest is, is even more diverse. The life is even more diverse underground than it is above ground. It's very complex and all the niches are taken. And the same with a prairie. Um, I didn't realize until I was on an Idaho prairie in the spring that, oh, it's just like the rainforest is layered. And there's something taking those upper spaces right down to the ground level and underground. Um, and then we have invasive plants like garlic mustard. And invasive plants are not just aggressive garden thugs, what they do is they displace the natural communities. And because they come from away, they don't have those insects that have adapted to feed on them in their native home. And so they get an edge over our native plants, which are um, do have relationship, they are set back by native diseases and native insects. So these have no restraints. And they have all kinds of mechanisms for getting the upper hand. So garlic mustard is evergreen, so it's photosynthesizing much longer than the native understory um, plants. It's a biennial, so that first year rosette often shades out the seeds of native plants so they can't germinate. Um, here it is flowering, you see all those, those little um, spur-like structures, those are going to be all full of thousands and thousands. And I think one, I think I've read that one, um, one garlic mustard plant can send out 2,000 seeds and they're light and they're windborne and they just, they have a fantastic reproduction rate. And in addition to that, it exudes chemicals that kill the mycorrhizae in our forest that the forest trees depend on. And there's a relationship with invasive Asian earthworms. So there's that, that complex web um, that they've really um, disrupted. Another bad side effect, they're trap plants. So there are certain native um, moths and butterflies that can only feed on mustard family plants. You know, they're specialized on that family. And so they're attracted to lay eggs on this plant but then when the caterpillars hatch, they can't eat it. So they die because they can't eat something else. So we have these um, 
really insidious um, plants, and, and deer don't eat it, but we can. It makes the best pesto. And you actually can eat the seeds, like mustard seeds, and you can eat the roots, use it like horseradish. But it took me a while to get around to this because I was so busy pulling it, and I hated it so much. But um, we can look at that life cycle, cycle. Okay, it's a biennial, right? So it grew the first year. It put its energy into flowering. If you cut it at the ground at this point, it dies. It's put its energy into flowering and starting to make seeds. If you pull it up and throw it on your pile, it has so much energy in it, it will ripen those seeds and they'll spread all over the place. And also, you're, when you pull it up, you're disturbing the ground, so you're just bringing more seeds up to light for germination. So, um, And then things, yeah. Yep, at, cut it at the right stage. So if you wait too long, it goes to seed. If you do it too early, it'll bloom again. So, you know, just when it's blooming like that. So that, you know, there's a whole whole lot of people doing ecological landscaping who are figuring this out, looking at, oh, well, horticulture tells you to weed, and ecology or botany tells you if you disturb the soil, you're going to have more weeds. So we're, we're really beginning to learn from nature. Um, things like bittersweet vines have become a really serious problem because of increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And that increased carbon dioxide causes plants to grow faster and grow more. So since vines aren't making a lot of structure like a tree does, they're putting all their energy into growing like crazy which is why suddenly even things like grapevines that we've always had on the roadside are you know, bringing down the telephone wires. So bittersweet has several survival strategies. You can see that it's, it starts girdling trees, and it grows up to the very top, and all of that weight, as soon as you get an ice storm, it just breaks trees. It's covering their leaves so they can't photosynthesize. Um, so that's something from a way that doesn't seem to have any pests except uh, except people. And then, of course, it puts out lots of berries that the birds love. Another one, burning bush. So this is a house a couple doors down from me, and you know they had this little burning bush hedge by their driveway, and it's now it's like three acres of nothing but burning bush. And this is the Appalachian Trail in Kent, where I live. And you know, somebody in the neighborhood had barberry. Um, fall and spring are a really good time to keep an eye on things. So um, we have green Christmas ferns; those are native. But all of the all of the color in there, after the native shrubs have lost their leaves, is um, well, that orangey red is barberry that the birds spread the seeds. So. With my garden coach clients, it's such a simple thing if you think about it. You know, we all think we should go around deadheading all the time, right? If you have desirable plants like this little native goldenrod that grows in the shade and it's a really beautiful plant and goldenrod is one of the most important plants. It's one of the 10 best of the best plants to support pollinators and it's really a really important pollen and nectar source in the fall. If you want more of it, don't deadhead it, right? And if you want more of it somewhere else, if you're taking a walk, if you're walking the dog, if you're jogging and you see it somewhere, you know, bring some of the seeds home and whack them around where you would like some. So don't deadhead the good stuff, but do deadhead the bad stuff. Um, this is barberry and garlic mustard in my side yard. So, you know, if you have something that's burying or flowering, if you can't get rid of the whole plant, just at least prune it afterwards so you're cutting off those propagules. Okay, so we have some really adaptable garden plants that you see all over the country. So Amsonia Blue Star, this is Amsonia Tabernay Montana, and it has that white milky sap, so I've never noticed anything eating it, but it does support pollinators. Virginia creeper is a great plant. It's not, um, you know, people don't distinguish it from poison ivy. And bittersweet 
girdles trees, it wraps around, but you may recall in that slide I showed a little while ago, the Virginia creeper grows straight up the trunk and then it kind of drapes itself out along the branches and it does not smother its host. You know, it has co-evolved with our native trees. So it grows in sun and shade. It's a wonderful climbing vine and it also makes a great ground cover. I would not recommend putting it on a wooden house. It has hold fast that, you know, will wreck your siding, but you know, here's a great use. What are you supposed to plant in this three inch crack between the driveway and the wall? You know, plant a couple um, Virginia creeper seeds and there you go. Here's one of, this is not a native plant. This is geranium macrorhizum, means big root. And this is one of those problem solver plants. Macrorhizum, big root, the, the roots are like they're like a hand almost on the surface and they have a way of just sort of flowing around other plants and they smell so the deer don't eat them. They're, that geranium smell really, really strongly. And if, so here they are in the winter. They have this winter presence a little bit. They just flop down. They grow in dry shade under maple trees. And so here's a place where it's under a maple tree, the maple leaves just fall, and they flatten out a little bit, they turn a little red in the cold, some of the leaves just rot, but they're great companions for even small bulbs like snowdrops. And then in the spring, you know, they grow up a little taller once they start growing, and you can see that there, there's daffodil foliage in there, so you can plant daffodils with them and they just stand up and cover the mess of the daffodil foliage. So they're both occupying that same niche but they're, one is having a, a growth cycle at one time of year and then this is coming along so they're filling the niche. Um, another really useful plant is ladies mantle and this works really well to span, it grows in, in quite a bit of shade and it grows in full sun. So if you have a bed, say, that needs to make the transition from sun to shade, this is a really great plant to repeat. And I've never seen anything eat it. It blooms for a long time. Um, lamb's ears, uh, penstem and huskers red, euphorbias, um, nothing really eats them and they're lovely and they last a long time and they're adapted to the penstemon will grow in quite a bit of shade and it'll grow in full baking sun. Um, this, the yellow foliage is the Amsonia Tabernay Montana that I showed a little earlier, blue star, and then um, Aronia, chokeberry, which I have found at first the deer didn't touch and now they're starting to do that. So that's a little bit of a problem. But they bloom early, they're graceful, and they have these berries that, you know how you plant winter berries for the birds and for winter interests and then the robins come through in November and eat every blessed one and you're just looking at gray sticks all winter? They don't call these chokeberry for nothing. They're really astringent. And so they freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw throughout the winter. And then on their return migration, I always get, I have a grove of these planted right outside my office window. I can see this from my desk. The bluebirds return and there's one day in March where these red berried shrubs are full of bluebirds and it's the most heart-stoppingly beautiful sight. So I, I have uh, clients who are really, really total bird nuts and I, did some garden things for them and planted it right outside their window and she called me and said, it did just what you said it would do. You know, I've been putting out mealworms and trying to get bluebirds for years and they never came before. <laughs> so that was pretty good. Okay, so pay attention to the kind of places you have now that we've seen that we have adapt adaptations of different kinds of plants what wants to be there. And in nature, things you can visibly see how things sort themselves out. So this is a, an Audubon Center where down at the bottom, there's 
elderberries and there's a kind of sedge that likes it wet and then further uphill you can see what a strong delineation this is this is not planted um, so what wants to grow there this is a place near me that has acidic soil you know really rocky mineral rich but nutrient poor soil and the um, hay scented ferns and the mountain laurel were already there so they just took out what they didn't want and let those things tell them. The site will inform you what wants to grow there. Um, this is Veronica in Canis Picata, and no matter how much grit I wheeled up that slope, I never could grow it. Here it is in Minnesota. So it wasn't that it wasn't hardy. It's next to a driveway in grit, far away from any hose, and looking absolutely beautiful. So um, this is the Denver Botanic Garden, and they do these low water gardens. This is alkaline soil and plants that don't need water. So if you have that kind of situation, you're going to want to look at things like dianthus and centranthus and, um, and salvias, a lot of different salvias in here. And verbascums, the mullins, those tall yellow ones. I mean, is this gorgeous or what? And I, I don't think they water it at all. So instead of trying to constantly amend soil to be that ideal garden soil, whatever kind of place you have, there's something that, you know, I hate to give agency to plants, something that wants to grow there. So nutrient poor soil, little blue stem grass, it's just, it's such a beautiful grass. Um, things like Comptonia, sweet fern is not actually a fern. Um, the deer don't really want to eat it. It's it's fragrant. It's it's um, nitrogen fixing, so it actually does enrich the soil a little bit, and it grows in sun or shade. And this is Lupinus perennis. This is our eastern native lupin. This is not what you see in Maine, and the ones you see everywhere in Maine are actually invasive. They they have escaped the gardens, and they're Pacific Northwest species, and if you plant this native Lupinus perennis in a, in a nice, rich garden soil bed, it will die instantly. It wants really lousy, acidic, sand, grit, gravel, you know, horrible stuff that you think you'll never grow anything in. Look at it in this meadow. So she just seeded a few with a with, um, little blue stem. And there's a, there's a rare endangered butterfly called the Carner Blue Butterfly. And just like with the garlic mustard, it lays, it can only eat lupins. So in Maine, it, it lays its eggs on that West Coast native lupin. And the caterpillars hatch and they die because they can't eat it. They can only eat this one specific plant. I uh, can't tell you how many um, bear berries, Arctostaphylus uva ursi, I have killed um, because my soil is too darn good. But here it is in Maine at the edge of a driveway. You know, it's a, it's a circumpolar plant. It grows on mountains. So, you know, rocky, gravelly, acidic, well-drained soil. If you pamper it, it will die. Okay, so sunny, open, windy places. Um, you want to look for those silver plants that are holding on to moisture and succulents like I love the sedum angelina, this golden foliage sedum, or silvery grasses or artemisias. You know, this is growing in a rock ledge facing the sun. You know, if you have a hot sunny terrace, if you have containers, you're going to sure do a lot better with um, with sedums and other succulents in containers than you would do, say, with a hosta or something with one of those big dark leaves. Or thymes and cactus. This is our native Apuntia cactus. This is the roof of City Hall in Chicago. You know, the windy city. So it's pretty windy up on top of City Hall. So what did they plant? They planted native prairie plants that grow in that native windy prairie. Or even this is a garden on Commercial Street in Provincetown, um, drought-resistant Coreopsis and um, Nepeta, the cat mints, with kind of gray, silvery gray foliage, very drought-resistant. Or the, 
bluish junipers. So, you know, you look at even like blue rug junipers or a lot of the ground covering junipers, they look awful this time of year. This is um, Juniperus horizontalis wiltonii, weeping over a wall in Minnesota where it gets like 40 or 50 below zero. And they said they never get any winter burn on this plant. So I think the more silver, the more protected it is. Okay, well, wet spaces. Um, this is a periodically overflowing brook and there's Joe pie weed and all kinds of grasses in there and physostegia that can really take wet or dry. Um, this is at the Berkshire Botanical Garden and it's a, a detention basin. This is where the water that runs off the road it has to go somewhere. So they run it into this place and they've got um, native shrub dogwoods, they've got native winter berries, um, pussy willows, all of these suckering shrubs that really like it wet, but can take it when it dries out. So looking at what grows in a roadside ditch might suggest what you do with um, wet areas in your yard, rather than trying to fill them in. <coughs> so here's the Heritage River birch, that's a um, the, you know, a white birch would not like it super wet, but this is a, a, a birch that is native to riversides. Or a suckering native um, red twig dogwoods, Cornus dolinifera. Of course, winter berries like it wet. And so here's, an, here's a trick. Winter berries, boy, the deer love them. They just chew them down. I have a, um, a, a friend and colleague who, he said that 10 years ago the deer didn't used to eat them, now they eat them. And he surrounds them with inkberry, which is an evergreen native holly, and the deer don't like that, so they actually protect the winter berries, which grow in the same kind of conditions. So other plants that like it wet, um, Juncus effusus, that, that um, the, the reed that you see there, um, a lot of carex, and this pink flowered plant is turtle head, chilone. So here's a plant, I have been in the floodplain of the Susquehanna River, and in the spring, you know, the river overflows its banks and it just fills the woodlands. And this is such a great example of how you can use th um, those niches to make a really self-sustaining planting. So on the left, before the deciduous trees overhead leaf out, it's Virginia bluebells. And you know, you can see it looks like a great plant for hummingbirds, it is. So it's it's a it's a good uh, plant for early bees and for the early hummingbirds. And it's in a family, it's related to pulmonarias. You can see the similarity. And what pulmonarias do, and um, I think that's what's going on here too, is most of them are blue. When they've been pollinated, they turn pink. The flowers turn pink, and that alerts the bees or whatever pollinators that it's already been pollinated, so it's not producing nectar anymore. Why would it keep producing nectar when it's been pollinated? So it gives those co-evolved insects a clue. So they go dormant. They seed like crazy. They go dormant and they're just a floppy, ugly mess. But then the ostrich ferns come up and they cover all the mess. So it's like, it's like self-mulching. This is a really self-sustaining um, kind of uh, combination. So if you have a sort of wet area in the woods, you know, maybe you're shunting water off your driveway into the woods, um, this is a, a really great way to fill space. Okay, rocky places. Um, sometimes you can't dig to plant. This is my friend in Austin who's a wonderful gardener and she's just noticing what looks good on the roadside and collecting seeds because as a friend in uh, Tucson said that gardening there is more like mining. <laughs> um, and you know, so often people try to grow lawn over the ledges in their lawn. And what these people did was they took a hose and they blew all the soil off and grew all of these sempervivums after 25 years, the whole ledge was covered as like this whole wonderful landscape instead of trying to grow grass on top of rocks. 
Um, so things like Euphorbia mercenides and, and these low sedums, this is on a, on a ledge in northwest Connecticut, shallow rooted things. Um, the other option is to plant seeds. So California poppies love it in the gravel and they'll just keep self-sowing. I think they planted a few here a few years ago and they just keep self-sowing. And as you can see, they have a few rocks. You know, things like lavender love rocks. If you put nice wood chip mulch around lavenders, they'll rot. The sun hits, I mean, the, the rain hits and bounces up fungal spores and gives it all kinds of rotty diseases. So lavenders like being in the rocks. So plant them in rocks, mulch them with gravel. Same with time. So um, pussy toes, same thing. Um, sometimes we have rocks that are in the shade. I remember going to um, Bartholomew's Cobble and there were these humongous boulders and all the leaf litter and um, Asarum canadense, that native Asarum that has little brown flowers that rest on the ground that you never can see. They were up there, so you were looking up into them. This is at the coastal Maine Botanic Garden. So resist the urge to clean the duff, you know, the needles and the decomposing leaves off your rocks and you'll be able to grow things like polypody ferns and um, the other leaves are Mayanthemum, the Canada Mayflower. And notice what grows where, you know, as in that earlier shot I showed with the mountain laurel and hay scented ferns, this was at the, um, the coastal Maine Botanic Garden and they noticed that, oh, there are hay scented ferns colonizing the cracks in all these natural ledges. So when they did new stonework, they put that in and just let them do their thing. They just fill the space. Okay, shade. So those layers, um, I love my coaching clients because they don't ask, how do I get the moss out of my grass? They ask, how do I get the grass out of my moss? You know, if you have a path or a side yard that looks like that, it's telling you something that lawn does not want to grow here. Um, cultivate your moss, give it some water, keep, blow the leaves off it. Um, that's what wants to be there. Um, this is the, um, the moose wood, that Acer pensavanicum that I showed earlier. It's an understory tree. It has this beautiful painted bark and those, those big tender leaves turn this gorgeous buttery color in the fall. So it's an understory tree that's putting the layers back, just like in the forest. Um, people often say, oh, those native azaleas are so leggy. Well, they're leggy because they grow in community. They haven't been bred to be, you know, balls covered with flowers. And when you have leggy plants in your garden, that allows you to put those layers back so it's more like the forest where you have, you know, overstory trees, understory trees, understory shrubs, and a layer, a ground layer. And so where is there room for weeds to seed in here? You know, the more plants you can pack into more niches, the lower maintenance you will have and the more sustainable, self-sustaining community. So um, hostas, of course, grow in the shade if you don't have deer. Epimediums are a wonderful plant for dry shade. They just, they come out, they look like little sprays of orchids. And um, cyclamen heterofolium wants dry shade. So if you, another plant that if you put it in rich, moist soil, it ain't gonna make it. But if you have gravelly, gritty soil, so this is perfect for between the roots of trees where other things don't wanna grow because the tree roots suck all the moisture out of the soil, especially on a slope. And we often have those different conditions within very short distances. So this is a yard in Maine. And the owner showed me the, the map of the, the geological map of the different soil types in Maine. And there's a diagonal that cuts through the whole state and it cuts right through this bed, right here. So, you know, it's kind of upland, more like woodland soil above. And down below where these primroses are, it's heavy, wet clay. And so there's a real transition from, from woodland 
to things that will grow in heavy wet clay, um, like these Primula japonica. And I love this grass. This is um, a Carex uh, Bowls Golden. So wonderful kind of color. And this is a, a garden I made for a client in Kent. And they have this west-facing sun-baked terrace. The sun hits a tall white building and bounces in it. So it's you know, really hot and sunny all afternoon. And then there's a pond right next to it. So on the slope facing the sun, I planted prairie plants. And everything here is native except for the yellow um, um, Achillea, Yarrow. I wish I'd planted a native one because it just somehow seems out of place. But it's Spirobolus, the um, prairie dropseed grass, and Coreopsis. But because there's such a high water table down at the very bottom, you see the pink and white flowers. That's um, um, that swamp milkweed. And then uh, Pycnanthema muticum, the mountain mint next to the pond, and Joe Pye weed and sensitive ferns were already there. So you can have a really sunny, a really dry spot really close to a really wet spot. Um, like here at Coastal Maine Botanic Garden where these dry rocky ledges, um, all they did was take out what they didn't want. They took the weeds out and left what grew there. And then the water sheets down and collects at the base. So they planted things like Regersia and and um, Japanese iris, and then it comes up again, and there's the native soil with low bush blueberries. Um, or this place where their lawnmower kept getting bogged down in the lawn. Uh, it's, you know, it's slanted from two directions. And so on the ledge, they have sedums and things that will grow in very little soil and full sun and dry. At the base of the ledge, where all the water ran from every direction, this is a great problem-solving plant. Um, it was called Senecio aureus, golden ground sill. Now it's called Pacara aurea. And it, um, it's really aggressive. It'll grow in sun or shade. It likes it wet. It'll grow in just kind of regular soil, but it doesn't flower as tall. Um, so it's a really good thing to colonize a place you don't want to mow. Here's, here's a, a, a Dallas yard. Uh, it's a, a driveway with planted pavers with buffalo grass in right next to a water runnel with horsetails in, which you would not want to let loose in your garden, but you can plant in a container of water. And don't, they look like fiber optic, don't they? I mean, they're just the way the light goes through them is so beautiful. But this is a plant that existed at the time of the dinosaurs. Um, it's a survivor, so you really don't want it to survive in your perennial garden. <laughs> so what else can gardeners do? Well, um, plant a, a great variety, you know, plant for diversity to attract diverse kinds of pollinators. You can even grow roses organically. Um, don't use chemicals, we don't need to. You know, if we plant the right kinds of plants, um, there's no need. You can grow roses if you have plants that are attracting beneficial insects, which will either parasitize, meaning lay eggs in pest insects, or just eat them, predators. So the more diversity you have, um, I think we've come to start believing that we're really gardening for insects. Plants like dill, um, dill is not only a larval plant for a lot of butterflies, but anything with an umbel-shaped flower like that is going to attract a lot of, of tiny, tiny, you know, tiny flowers attracting tiny insects that are parasitic, parasitic, parasitic <laughs> um, wasps and um, other beneficial insects that will be in your garden doing pest patrol and eating those aphids. Um, plants like um, Physostegia virginiana. I used to kind of hold something against this because it was just like pink, but it blooms forever. It blooms for like six or seven weeks and it really feeds the pollinators. It's aggressive. And there's a cultivar called Miss Manners that just sits there in a little clump. And I think, what a, you know, what a party pooper. <laughs> You know, it's boring, it just sits there. This plant travels, so if you want to really help pollinators, planting one little clump of something doesn't help much. Planting something that's gonna run in a place where 
you're happy that it runs is really doing a good job. And so the goldenrod, this is a uh, just about to become chrysalis butterfly. I set up my tripod, had it focused. I was, went back in a couple hours, it was gone. You know, a bird ate it or something. Um, Monarda is a really, really good thing to be planting for pollinators. This is the mountain mint, and it's really minty. It does what mints do, but it's a terrific plant to put around things like blueberries because the deer don't want to stick their nose in there, and it attracts so many beneficial insects at any place you have a place for this. It's not hard to pull out if it goes where you don't want it to, but plant masses of this um, to support bees. This, you know, we need to think about pollen and in the trade, when you have uh, winter berries, they'll tell you what male cultivar fertilizes what female cultivar, right? So they're dioecious, meaning they're male flowers on one plant, females on the other. That's a really good survival strategy to prevent inbreeding. You want outcrossing for that genetic diversity. But what they don't tell you is things like, this is um, Ilex glabro compacta, so it's the, it's the ink berry, that, that um, evergreen holly. It's a female clone. And so if you don't have males, you're not going to get berries, but they don't mark males to tell you. See the little bump in the middle? You know, that's the ovary, so that tells you that's a female flower. And I failed to realize until I really got into it that, you know, pollen is really important, our, not just to fertilize, but our native bees that are emerging really early, like in March from the ground, need food and protein in pollen is what bird, what bees need. They need that protein. So they eat it, they take it back to their nests and lay eggs in it so that uh, when the, when the uh, baby bees hatch, they have that really valuable food source. So we're always advised to plant, you know, X number of hollies for the berries to, you know, some paltry number of males. But if you want to support pollinators and especially native bees, you want to plant a lot of males. So that's a new way of thinking. Um, planting a couple purple cone flowers isn't doing all that much for pollinators, but planting a whole mass of them is. Planting early in the season, the very earliest. So these are these are snow crocus, crocus tomasinianus, which the squirrels don't seem to like. You know, the squirrels that eat all the other crocuses. I planted these close to 30 years ago, and I still have them, and they just reproduce and spread themselves around. But these are blooming in my garden now, and so when there's a warm day in January, look what shows up, the honeybees from the farm a mile up the road. Um, those early things, like shad blows, are so important. Um, this is my side yard. So the beginning of the season and the end of the season is when you want to plant for pollinators. Um, this is, there's a, a um, a series of really hardy Korean garden mums that is no longer being made, but I give them to people when I can. Um, this blooms until from like late October until into December, if we don't get it really bad. And the bees hang out there because with our, na our native plants, with the way the climate has changed, our native plants are all gone and the bees are still active. So even though I'm a native plant, promoter, we need to feed them from the very beginning to the very latest. So this is Boltonia, there's your um, chokeberry. Um, plant, for wild, plant for wildlife and it will come. <laughs> um, this is an article that it's on my website that I wrote about um, planting to support the birds in winter. So this is my yard, which has been, back when I did a lot of stock photography, um, the same picture of my lawn was used in an ortho book to illustrate lawn weeds, and in a book on the Freedom Lawn to illustrate an environmentally, ecologically rich and desirable organic lawn. So <laughs> um, let those ajugas go, and when they're done, just mow them. And so I'm 
I'm really working on reducing lawn and planting more for, for pollinators and plants that just want to be there, that will take over. And what I do is I just lay down cardboard and I do a little bit at a time. This was my um, chief sustainability officer who helped me um, break it down. Um, so how lovely, instead of a lawn in this fancy house in New Canaan, Connecticut, you know, it's really supporting a lot of wildlife. Um, if you want those things, you need to leave the seed source. So if you have a field or a meadow, all of those seeds will be in your seed bank. If you have burning bush and barberry in the understory, that's what's going to be your seed bank. So leave this standing. Insects are overwintering in it. Um, the seeds will be distur dispersed, <laughs> not disturbed, and they will seed themselves in any disturbed soil. So I hope this helps you um, think about how to uh, take advantage of plants that want to survive in your yards. And I welcome questions. So thank you. Any questions? Okay. Yeah. Yes. And I'm doing soil tests on the job. Yes, I always ask people to do a soil test, or I do it. And it's not my strong suit interpreting it, so sometimes I ask for help, and I always ask for the organic recommendations. And I think that they always tell you to fertilize no matter what. And as the same person who was so clever to put um, ink berry around the winter berries so the deer wouldn't eat them, said, they all grow in reasonably decent soil. We're not trying to grow corn here. And I think that it's really irresponsible to be dumping especially synthetic um, nutrients into the soil and having them wash off. And, you know, people have these companies that, that fertilize their lawn four times a year, whether it needs it or not. And, and then they wonder, gee, why is the water all green? It's all full of algae in my pond. Um, so the other, the other reason I now really insist, this was so sobering, um, I have a client in an old house on a lake right on it. And um, she had a, a garden helper who couldn't read English, and she had chemicals in her shed, and he took it upon himself to spray the garden with broadleaf weed killer. And, you know, some things died and some things didn't, like 25-year-old oak leaf hydrangeas, gone. And, you know, I consulted somebody who knew a lot more than I did about, you know, soil restoration. And he said, you know, put, put compost on in the fall and then make compost tea from soil on that site so that you have the native mycorrhizae that can, you know, recolonate. But when you get a soil test, at least in Connecticut and probably everywhere, they also do the background lead levels. And I think it's 100 parts per million that's above that is dangerous. One of her beds had more than 20,000 parts per million. And the woman was having neurological difficulties and memory trouble. And... You know, it's like a 100-year-old house. How many times has it been scraped and painted? And all that's going into the lake, along with the runoff for the, for the broadleaf herbicide, which had like four really toxic chemicals in it. Um, anything with shallow roots, like a dogwood, would be affected. But, um, boy, the lead is, is serious. And so, you know, people might want to pick a sunny spot and put a little vegetable garden in, uh, for to garden with their grandchildren with 20,000 parts per million lead in it. It's, it's dangerous, yeah. Two towns. Well, they're famous, too. I mean, I, so I'm, an, I'm a NOFA accredited organic land care professional, and the people who, you know, did those pilot programs were teaching the course, and they're running whole new courses on organic land care because, I mean, it is so irresponsible, but it's such a profit center. They come and they do the weed and feed. They fertilize, 
you know, however many times a year they're mowing in a drought when the grass hasn't even grown. Um, and so we found that, you know, quote, I don't know how it got to be traditional, um, land care has been kind of resistant because if you take a soil test and learn that it doesn't need anything, boy, there's a profit center gone. Yeah. So you had a lot of clover, clover okay, which is nitrogen fixing. <clears throat> yeah, it used to it used to be that the mark of a high quality grass seed mix was it had clover and yarrow and other things in it. And, you know, there's the crux of it. So simplicity means instability. And a lawn is the essence of unsustainability. It's a monoculture. It requires all of those inputs to look good, unless you like a juga in the lawn like I do. I mean, I just figure a lawn is green stuff that you mow. Um, although a friend of mine pointed out, who's a science teacher, that she has selected for low-blooming daffodils, right? Because you mow the lawn and the tall ones get cut off, and so the ones that bloom under the mower height are the ones that reproduce and, and survive. And, but I've had another person say, well, we need to start thinking about dandelions as wildflowers. So anyway, thank you. <laughs>